Jim Philpott, I'm the Dean of Institutional Research, Policy and Grants at Cheney College. One of the presentations uh, that I find most enjoyable that I get to do every year is our new faculty orientation. At Chapey College, one of the things that we do when we have new tenure track faculty is we provide a course their first semester of release time. And then every Friday morning they meet for three hours to learn key factors that are integral to their success as new faculty. Uh, they learn about the community college system, they look, learn about Chapey College policies and practices. And as a table setter for that conversation that ensues as they learn about uh, different uh, educational technology, uh, one of the things I get to present as that table setter is information about our student population and performance outcomes. And one of the things, even though many of our faculty have prior experience in the community college system, is they're, I'm, I'm always in wonder at how shocked they are when they find out about how long it takes our students to reach their educational goals. Uh, they always anticipate, and I think it's part of the nomenclature that we use, where we talk about a community college and a two-year institution interchangeably many times. And obviously, those of you who are involved in the community college system know that, that that's just not the case, that our students really take much longer, that there's a longer educational pathway that's always surprising to our faculty. So I just want to take a few minutes to share what we share with our faculty to sort of debunk that myth of a two-year community college student. One of the things that we do is we look at our most recent cohort of uh, award earners, looking at certificate and degree earners. And using the Chancellor's Office first file, we walk back from their date of award to their first semester in the community college system, and then just perform some data arithmetic calculations to determine time it takes students to earn a degree or certificate. And you can see from this aggregated data here, on average for associate degree earners at our institution, it takes about 4.6 years. It varies a little bit. Uh, you can see ABT award earners, AES transfer degree earners take about four years. It's a little bit longer for associate science degree earners. But even for our local certificates, these tend to be low unit value certificates that are awarded locally and are not approved by the Chancellor's Office, it still takes over three and a half years for our students to earn a degree or certificate. And again, this isn't uncommon. This is fairly typical of what you'll find in many community colleges. When we further unpack some of that data and we start looking at the units that students earn, and you'll hear this later in the day, I believe, with some of the other presentations about AB 705, about guided pathways, this really is sort of some of the evidence behind that major initiative and that major push to start uh, looking at time to award completion and streamlining pathways for students through the community college system. What we find when we start looking at the unit values that students accrue is there's a large number of really unnecessary units that students accrue as they go through their educational journey. And again, you can see it almost aligns with the time to award, which you would expect. But even among some of those with local certificates, they're earning 70 to uh, degree earners up to 110 almost units. Uh, unnecessary units as they engage in career exploration, as they engage in trying to identify that pathway uh, to awards to their interest. One of the things we had the good fortune to be involved in this past fall was working with the research and planning group in the transfer, uh, through the gate transfer study. And we were a pilot school for that. And as part of that process, what we did is we identified students who were transfer prepared, transfer ready, or had earned an ADT award, at, but had not yet transferred from our institution. We're still at a community college, even though they had a transfer degree. And uniformly through those focus groups, what they told us was, we really spent way too much time at the beginning, at the front end of our educational experience, trying to find meaning into our educational journey. Uh, that if we'd had more directed uh, information, more, more contact with counselors and faculty in that process to learn about what our interests were and what matched to that, uh, then we became engaged. Once we could identify that pathway, that's when the magic happened. That's when we became engaged in the process and the learning really meant something. There was meaning then to the educational pathway. Prior to that, they really bemoaned the time they spent going through the educational process just searching. And you can see it reflected in the time to completion and the, the number of units that students accrue. There's also a number of student-centered factors, though, that fit way into uh, 
the, the time it takes students to get to their goals. This is data from the community college system in general. And one of the things, again, that always surprises our faculty <coughs> is the low number, low percentage of students who are enrolled full time. And you can see how consistent this is over the past 10 years. This is system wide in the community college system. So you're talking 1.5 to 2 million students in any given year, credit students. Uh, and in no instance, in any fall semester, was there more than a third of the students that were enrolled full time. And this is really somewhat of a generous uh, weighting of it as well. This is students enrolled in 12 or more units. If we were to look at students who are actually enrolled in 15 or more units, this goes down to about 9%. Part of what impacts that, as we know, is our student population changes is the numbers of students and the percentage of students that are economically disadvantaged. Uh, again, this isn't as broad of a slice as it could be. This is just looking at students who receive financial awards. There's other categories of economically disadvantaged status that the Chancellor's Office weighs into the equation that raises this even a little bit more. But even in a generous uh, look at this kind of information and data, uh, you can see there's been a 70% increase over the last 10 years system-wide in the number of students who are receiving some form of financial assistance. And at Chapey, uh, this is very typical. You can see the variance that exists from institution to institution across the system. Uh, we've actually doubled over the last few years. We're over 60% of our students, and when we factor in those other factors that weigh into economically disadvantaged status, it can be upwards of 70% of our students who are receiving some form of economic aid. What that has an impact on is student workload. Uh, augmenting their income, many of our students are working a number of hours, and it takes away from their time to be able to be enrolled full time. Chapey, this is our most recent data from the last academic year, 2016-17, our full year. Uh, four out of five of our students, 80%, plan to work. One out of two, over 50%, are working more than 20 hours per week and one out of four are working at least 30 hours per week. So that's competing with their time. And you throw in other factors, we'll go through this next slide relatively quickly, but there are other factors, other activities that they plan for. We capture this information at the point of assessment with our students. Uh, so it's self-reported data, but it's what they plan to, to engage in other activities. This could be child care, this could be uh, other act community activities. But it's additional time again, so you factor that in, in addition to the work hours, <coughs> and then the time that comes for studying that they plan. Pretty soon we're talking about students trying to balance 60 to 70 hours of competing factors throughout the course of a week. Again, there are a number of other factors that are involved that impact that time to goal completion. We talked about the undefined educational goals. Uh, students often are searching for that educational goal that maps to their, their outcomes. Many times at Chapey, one of the things we find is we have a ton of accounting majors. The reason for that is purely because it's the first, first it's course, a. first one listed. It's A. <laughs> right. Um, and the students just need, no, they need to pick an educational goal to get priority registration, so they're picking the very first thing. It's not an informed choice, and it doesn't happen until much later, usually after they're enrolled for, for a number of uh, semesters. Navigating the system, one of the challenges, and we're true of this, the system has 43% uh, first-time student population, first-generation population. So many times, students are navigating the system blindly. They don't have reference points within their family that they feel comfortable with, and identifying when they have questions how to navigate our processes. And you'll hear this with some of the guided pathways conversation as well. Um, we've been challenged, and I, it was an eye-opener, I think, for our faculty when we went through our faculty orientation, uh, to pick a major and find out information about it off of our webpage. Um, I would ask all of you, especially in the community college system, to do the same. Uh, pick, pick one and then try and find information about careers, about uh, the pathway through that program, about other information like financial aid. A lot of times we don't make it as seamless as we think we do. We know where to find that information, but students, especially if they have no prior navigation experience, don't. And that also has an impact then on students being able to just find the resources they need to be successful. Systemic planning, all this we've been talking about as student center, but what are we doing as an institution? What are we doing as a system to help students navigate? I know Chafee, that's one of the things we talk about is long-range planning. 
uh, to help students in terms of course planning uh, three years out so that they know a course will be available to plan their educational schedules. If they don't know that exists, and I think we're pretty typical of many community colleges where there isn't that forethought and planning given about progressing through the pipeline to that educational <coughs> desired outcome. Uh, many students just, they, they'll get to a point where they just don't know which direction to go because we haven't made it easy and seamless for them to identify that pathway. The other thing we see too is that a lot of students delay enrollment in certain courses. Uh, one of the things that AB 705 I think will have a major impact on, some research we've conducted recently at Chapey College, what we found is that lower students assess mathematics the longer they delayed enrolling in that course. And I, I see a lot of heads nodding. You see that same thing at your institution. So they may accrue the units they need to reach that educational goal, but if math is, is most, of, we know, is part of most of majors, uh, they, they're delaying enrolling that math course and it keeps them from getting to that goal in a, a timely manner. And then certainly there's external economic factors. Uh, we saw quite a bit of a difference in, uh, over the past five years with the economic downturn or the recession. Uh, we actually had to cut about 25% of our sections. So it had a major impact on students being able to access the courses they need. So we're subject to some of those external variables as well. But all of this cumulatively tends to have an impact then on that time to goal completion for students. Uh, and it has an impact uh, of their ability not just to complete their educational goals, but then subsequent outcomes such as transfer. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you track at all time to goal um, based on whether a student goes on transfers to another institution or four year institution versus those who don't transfer? That has we, we do to some extent. I think indirectly we look at it by educational goal. So that's one of the things. There is some variance where we'll have students that start with one identified educational goal and that often changes as they are immersed in courses, uh, as they change their pathway. A lot of times what we see is they're moving from a transfer status to maybe a uh, certificate status because they have a, a, a work outcome in mind, that they're more directed to a career, a tech, career technical education program. But yes, we do look at it at least by educational goal, and we do see some of that variance about when they establish that educational goal. Jim, I was just wondering too if in looking at the mean number of credits accrued, if you also kind of assess the median and then kind of the distribution? We did. We did. And it's not too different. It's, okay. it's uh, just a little bit lower, but it's almost parallels. Okay. Uh, that was one of the things we looked at, both mean and median. Yeah, because that was different from our institution where we had some folks who were really pulling the mean uh, pretty aggressively. So, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, within this, and that was one of the things that we control for, some of those outliers. We will have the career student who has 200 plus units accumulated. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you.